main event, Richard Holloway. Richard comes to us from Louisiana, or is it Louisiana? Uh, depends on who you are, but Louisiana is normally then. Louisiana? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, comes to us from Louisiana. He comes from us, to us from the central of Louisiana Civil War. Right. So not northern, not southern, not eastern, not west, central. Uh, he's, uh, his office is right across the street from where we're going to stay at on our, on our door, right? Yep. All right. Um, the director of the Forts Randolph and UO State Historic Society sites sites in Pineville, Louisiana, which is right across the river from where we're going to stay. He serves on the editorial advisory board of America's Civil War magazine, which is one of the premier and uh, magazines that we get to read about. And uh, he has been president. Of his round table since 2008. They have forgotten how to have an election down there. But anyway. We won't allow it. Yeah, he didn't want, he didn't want to allow it. Okay. That kind of election call who used to be, but you know. Uh, so we're, we're just going to help with each other here. Okay. He's written all kinds of essays that have been published, and I'm not going to try to read them because I don't want to take up this time, but look in the newsletter, and he's going to talk to us, surprising, surprise, 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 on something having to do with the Red River campaign. And his talk is entitled, Arrested, Promoted, and Transferred, Richard Taylor's End to the Red River Campaign. Okay, Richard, you're up. Well, thank you uh, so very much for inviting me. Uh, I, I first want to make an offer to you. Uh, the uh, chief editor of the magazine, America's Civil War, uh, which, by the way, Bruce Allard just has another thing coming in the next issue. Uh, and he had one in the last issue. Um, they, he, the editor said, well, you know, you just finished a really great article on General Custer in Alexandria, Louisiana in 1865 right after the war. So he said, look, get names. And if you would all maybe, uh, um, you know, gather up and get names to like one of the two Kurtz, you know, by the way, having a, a round table with two Kurtz is like pretty amazing. You know, the, a yeah. double, a double curd round table. I mean, uh, you can't beat that. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, um, he said, get the, all the names and addresses of people that are interested in the mag uh, in the magazine and i will send it to them for free so you get a free copy of america's civil war magazine the summer edition with custer on the cover it, it not only covers him this is it's it's almost a special issue uh uh it has some other things like the top 12 civilians in the civil war that are underrated but it has custer uh here it, it has a um, Custer at, at uh, um, Yellow Tavern. It, it, it's 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 really great stuff in this magazine. So again, if you just uh, collect a uh, uh, a gathering of, of your addresses and send it, and make sure I get it, uh, we'll be glad to send you a copy free. Um, now I also want to thank y'all because again, I wish Bruce would have been here because in 1940, some guys came down from Illinois. And they came down to a place called Camp Borgard, where I used to work. I was the National Guard historian for a while. And um, they um, were the 106 U.S. I mean, no, excuse me, um, um, Calvary. And, and they were uh, uh, from Illinois. And they were known as the Black Horse Calvary. And they played baseball probably about a mile and a half from where I work. So. You know, and I actually had somebody donate some pictures. I'm planning on doing an article on sports uh, in civil uh, in central Louisiana during the Louisiana maneuvers of 1939-1940. And so I'm going to make sure and mention the great baseball team that the 106 Cab had, and, and when they played down there. Um, so that's one of the things I wanted to mention to you. Uh, now I'm here to talk a little bit about. Richard Taylor and the Red River Campaign. 
But I'm going to give you a little bit different story than you normally um, hear. And, uh, unless you want to buy one of my books on the Confederate Journals in the Trans-Mississippi Volume 3, which it tells most of the story, but not all of it. So anyway, here in, we, we start the story in Baton Rouge, where Baton Rouge and Franklin are where the Union armies are gathering their forces to make a Red River campaign. Now they start off in March, but before they're there, they're all gathered up in Baton Rouge, and there's a lot of Union troops in Baton Rouge. I mean, lots of them. And, and you know, what do they miss the most when they're riding home and they're in Baton Rouge and a fixed start on this magnificent campaign? What would you think would come to mind first and foremost with these troops? What, 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 do, they, what do they miss from home? Do anybody have a... They miss their mother's pie, which is why we had pie for dessert tonight. So now the letters I read were really great. There was like guys that said, Mom, I, I, you know, they were specific about which pies they wanted. Mom, I, I miss your, your custard pie. Or Mom, I miss your apple pie. How patriotic is that, by the way? And a lot of Illinois soldiers joined in and, and wrote these letters home and threw the mom like, boy, I sure wish. Well, you know what? The ladies of Baton Rouge were very accommodating to the occupying Union soldiers. And so what they did was they would make pies for the soldiers and they would sell them on the street. And, you know, the soldiers would come by and buy a piece of pie and take it back to camp and eat it. It, it, it was almost like home. And it, it was a really good, you know, situation because the Southern women didn't have a lot of money, you know, and they're occupied. So they can't really do what they are normally doing. And their husbands are all away. So they couldn't, you know, provide them with, with any funds. So what they would do is they would make and sell these pies. Now, some of them were just like what, you know, they missed from home, like the custard pies or, you know, pumpkin pie, things like that. So, but the Southern women were so accommodating in Baton Rouge that what they did was they added some special ingredients in there to make them really, really like their pie better than the ones at home. So what they would do is they would main, there were three main ingredients I found out that they included in the pies that they made for the federal soldiers occupying Baton Rouge. Uh, one was diamond dust. The other one was glass. And the, and the last one was strychnine. So I hope you all enjoyed your pies because I, I bring you, you know, a little bit of, uh, hey, we haven't forgotten in 160 something years. So, uh, yeah, we wanted to make sure you enjoy your pies. Look at that. I, I had one guy that I, I did this in Baton Rouge and one guy, particularly uh, John Potts. Uh, he's the president of the Baton Rouge Roundtable. And uh, I saw he only ate one piece of pie. I said, John, go ahead and take another piece of pie. And then I started reading the letters. Oh, well, Mom, uh, the captain told us we can't buy any more pie from these rebel women because one of our guys bought one yesterday and he's dead today. <laughs> so now when I say that they were poisoning the Yankee soldiers in occupying Baton Rouge, I really mean that. I found 17 letters, uh, eight newspaper articles about them poisoning pie. It was a big deal. Now, they did it in other places, but Baton Rouge was the place they inflicted the most ca uh, casualties on the federal soldiers. And most of them, you know, back then, you could drop dead from, you know, eating something, you know, wrong. You didn't know what it was. And, so, and sometimes even they had this stuff that they would put in pies. Normally, their moms would put in this pie called salitaris. Okay, well, that was sort of an ingredient, depending on how old you were, you may actually, it may be fatal to you. <laughs> and, and so that, they already, you know, were used to that type of stuff. They, I guess they probably weren't used to women, you know, nice Southern women trying to sell them a piece of pie that maybe would be detrimental. So a lot of them, they didn't know what was killing them. And so that's, the ladies kept doing it and they kept doing it. And then, then the stories appeared and the letters like that, like, hey, mom, you know, uh, we were walking down the street and this lady had this pie stand. And so, you know, the whole company bought pie and went back and, and uh, half of them died in the next week. So, uh, you know, now diamond dust was a little harder to get because you'd have to go to a jeweler store to get a diamond dust. And there weren't that many jewelers, jeweler stores in Baton Rouge. But anyway, there were uh, there was a lot of glass, ground glass, and there was a lot of strychnine. So that was the 
the de jure thing. So anyway, uh, just I wanted to give you a nice little warm welcome and, and you know, from Baton Rouge, uh, um, you know, the home of the national championship women's basketball team um, and give you a little, little bit of, uh, you know, uh, Southern uh, hospitality, you know, for, for, uh, for your meeting. Now, in all seriousness, and, and I was serious about that, they didn't do that to the past, but in all seriousness, let's start on this campaign. They finally get on the road. They come up to Fort DeRussi, which you'll find out in a little bit. Now, can it, does anybody have any idea, just ballpark, how long Fort DeRussi held out from the onslaught of Banks' troops? Uh, can't follow me. 18 minutes. 18. Uh, they held out for 18 minutes. So Banks gets and takes Fort DeRussi. It's not very well armed, and it's not very well fortified. It was mainly more of a deterrent for ships as opposed to land troops. So anyway, uh, Banks gets up there. He takes Alexandria. And then you get, uh, um, you know, where he goes up to Natchitoches. Now, one of the things they had in Natchitoches, which was, was a little bit special for, for the troops, is uh, they had a lot of coffee shops in Natchitoches. And a lot of the troops were able to, in, in, you know, indulge themselves in, in drinking some really nice coffee. Now, of course, if anybody knows about Louisiana coffee, during the war, they started rationing the coffee because there, there was not a lot of access to it. And New Orleans was occupied. And that was a big area to grow coffee. But you'd get most of your coffee from Cuba. Well, there's not a lot of ships coming in bringing from Cuba. So what they did was they would mix it up uh, with this stuff called chicory. And that was a hit. In fact, I mentioned Custer in Alexandria later on. Well, in 1873, Custer comes back, by the way, and, and uh, with a Russian prince and goes to New Orleans and attends the first Rex Parade in Mardi Gras. And he said, this coffee is better than any that I've had in the North. I mean, I guess he really liked, you know, the chicory. And they still use it today. But anyway, so Banks gets up to, to Natchitoches and he's, he's enjoying the coffee shops and everything. So he says, okay, well, let's get serious. Now, the problem is, is the mainly the boats can't really get up the Red River that much because it's sort of low. Some do, and they get all the way up to Grandy Corps, but they can't really follow the road that Banks has taken all the way up to Shreveport to capture the cotton and, you know, whatever else. He, he really wasn't interested in capturing troops or or places he was interested in capturing cotton now my favorite thing about the cotton is when the louisiana uh, in alexandria is when they would mark their cotton to be sold they, the confederate government would buy it so they would mark it csa for confederate states of america well when the union navy came in of course they claimed it is a prize there it is sitting right there on the shore they pulled over loaded it up on the boats and and they stamped it USN for United States Navy because that's their prize. So one day, one of the, one of the infantry officers uh, was on boat uh, for some reason, and he went over to one of the officers on the ship, and he said, well, you know, you have a lot of cotton there. Is that all you're here for? Uh, and he said, what, is, what does that stand for, USN CSA? Does it stand for United States Navy Cotton Stealing Association? <laughs> and and the, and the, you know the Navy guy had no answer to that one. So anyway, they they take a, they embark on this trip. Now they're opposed by eighty eight hundred men. Now this is thirty five thousand men that Banks has. They're opposed by eighty eight hundred men that Richard Taylor has. But see, Richard Taylor had already faced Banks over in Virginia, and he had a nice nickname for him because he helped feed the, the Confederate Army, called him Commissary Banks. And so when Richard Taylor, you know, gets these 8,800 people together, you know, to combat him, he sort of knows how Banks is going to react to different situations. And he knows he's a little panicky, you know, because he's a politician. He's not a soldier. Now, funny enough, and, and this was a weird little thing. Now, Sherman wanted to be the guy that led the Red River campaign. But they didn't let Sherman do it because Sherman was outranked by date of service as a major general with Banks. So Sherman had been a major general, but Banks had been a major general longer. And so he was able to, you know, usurp. Now, Sherman, it would have been really, really bad if Sherman, you know, would have taken over the Red River campaign because he, he, his college was right there. 
you know, that he, that he, uh, was president of. So he, LSU, the first LSU. So he knew the roads. He knew the people. He knew all the, you know, the tricks of the trade. It was, it was, you know, so they, we were lucky in the South that, that y'all, you know, elected to send that Massachusetts guy over there. Uh, you know, and by the way, at this point in the war, you know, you think that there's everybody's in, harmonious in, in the federal army. Well, no, they're not. Because all the troops over in the West, all the Illinois troops, hated all the New England troops. And they let them know it. I mean, there's there, there there's just as many letters as I've seen talking bad of guys from like Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin. There's just as many of them talking bad about the, the Eastern troops as they are talking bad about the Confederate troops. That was just sort of a weird little thing that I noticed. But anyway, so. Richard Taylor's like, okay, well, we don't want them to get to Shreveport. That's the capital of Trans-Mississippi right now. Uh, let's see if we can do something to augment our forces. Well, now, how are they going to do that? Well, one of the ways, and they would, ha they would actually get an extra 1,500 guys that had surrendered at Vicksburg. And, but wait, they've not been exchanged yet. They've been, you know, they're on parole and they haven't been exchanged yet. So they can't fight in the Confederate Army against the Yankees that are coming up the river. So how do they, how do they get it? Well, uh, there was a, a guy named governor Henry uh, Watkins Allen, and he was a very smart guy. He had been a general and just got wounded at Chalo and wounded at Baton Rouge. I mean, he was just a, he was a very staunch uh, uh, Confederate guy. And so uh, he came up with a way. He said, well, I'm going to take 1500 troops here that surrender from Vicksburg. that can't fight as Confederates. And I'm going to enlist them in the Louisiana militia, and they're going to fight with us in the Louisiana in the battles. But as the Louisiana militia, which is, means they're not violating their parole, because the parole said you cannot join the Confederate states and fight against it. They didn't say nothing about the Louisiana militia. So here's an extra 1,500 troops that they've got managed to get to fight. So I right, well, Banks uh, still has 35,000, and and um, you know a little over 10,000 now that Taylor has. That's not really good odds. Uh, but Banks did what Banks does. And so when Taylor gets up to Sabine Crossroads or Mansfield, there's a there's a big open field, and you'll see it when you're there. And they sort of did like a, a reverse crescent, you know, position where when the Confederate I mean when the Federals came up from the road, which had heavy forest on both sides, they would be right there in this trap. And so, okay, well, that's a good idea. Uh, still, you're facing, you know, 10,000 against 35,000. That's, that's bad odds. So they get up to Mansfield, and Banks has his troops strung out. You had Lee's cavalry, uh, Lee being the, uh, the command of the cavalry for the, for the army. Uh, you may have known him by his unit. Uh, he was the lieutenant colonel of the 7th Kansas Cavalry, which was known as Jenison's Jayhawkers. So, you know, he was a, he was not a uh, nice person, but he was in charge of all the cavalry in Banks' army. And then behind the cavalry, they had the wagons. And then they had a little bit of infantry in front of the wagons, but who wanted to walk behind a horse with, with, with <laughs> you, know, at, you know, walking up the road? And the dust kicked up. So they, they went behind the wagons, most of them, and the rest of the army was trailing along for a, like over a mile of just all the troops going up this road to Mansfield. Well, they get up there, and they're surprised, and the cavalry just get overwhelmed quickly. And then the wagons, just the horses bolt, the, the wagons get turned over. So that means all of the guys that are trying to get out of all that situation are really in trouble because it's hard to get down this clogged road. And there's where two, there, there's several people that were involved in this, but, but two specifically, uh, Illinois regiments, the 77th Illinois and the 120th Illinois. And um, they went up and there was like a fence row right there at Mansfield. And you'll see it, they, they recreated it. And they went up and they held that corner for most of the day. They were just getting slaughtered, but they were they held that for the most of the day. And I'm sorry, I said 120th. It's actually 130th. So they uh, they get up to 
to this fence row and they, they stay there and they're just getting slaughtered. And then Taylor says, you know what? Looks like we're winning this thing. So let's go ahead and, and make a charge. And we're going to put our Louisiana troops in, the division with the Louisiana troops in, and let them have the glory of kicking the, the Federals out. Well, it works good and bad. Because the guy in charge of the Louisiana division was a guy named uh, uh, Mouton. And he was from Lafayette, Louisiana. His, his father had been governor of Louisiana, Alexander Mouton. And so this guy got the honor to lead the charge. So he got on his horse. Every good thing to do in a charge. Don't get on your horse. And he gets on his horse and he leads the Crescent Regiment and the Louisiana Brigade, you know, at the, at the forefront. And they send the federal skedaddling, even though. However, there were a couple of guys that were sort of rounded up as prisoners from the 77th and the 130th. And I don't know which ones it actually was, but they actually shot Mouton off of his horse after he had captured them and they surrendered. Well, they reached down and picked up their guns and shot him. Oh, this infuriated the Louisiana troops. And so they just ran them all the way back down to Pleasant Hill. So you get down to Pleasant Hill, and, you know, it's considered a Union tactical victory or whatever. They retreated after the battle. That's not really a tactical victory to me. Now, the Confederates didn't pursue them, so it wasn't better. I would actually have to call that Pleasant Hill a draw because they really did not do anything, you know, other than some heavy damage. So they get down to Monet's Ferry, which is the next little area to go down. And uh, Taylor was so smart. He said, I'm going to send a cavalry division. Now it's under General B because General Green got killed at Grand Accord. So I'm going to send these cavalrymen down there and they're going to hold Monet's Ferry on the other side of the river, the Cane River. And then I'm going to come up behind them, the Yankee army at Cluchyville, and I'm going to have them in a pincer, and we're going to capture the entire federal army. And it almost worked until B got to Monet's Ferry, and he started looking around. He's like, man, I really don't want to get caught up in this. So I'm going to go take my guys, and we're going to go 30 miles to get some some uh, food, uh, you know, um, away from the scene of action. And so the, the Union army just went all the way back down to Alexandria. Now they get there. And they, they would normally leave on like April 26th. That's when they got there. Uh, but they can't because anybody that knows about Louisiana and the Red River and Alexandria knows that it just drains itself out around April. Uh, not a good time. So they call this Wisconsin guy named Joe Bailey and, uh, and you will be, you'll be hearing about him soon. And so Joe Bailey comes and he, he builds this wonderful dam and it raises the water level and the ships are actually able to escape and get down a little further down river. Uh, now the object, uh, was to get to Morganza. Now Morganza was where they had a union fort built and they were going to go down there and, and, uh, you know, take refuge there. And so, Taylor, like, rides into town, and, and he's like, man, look, they, they tried to burn the place down. They burned about a fourth of the city. You know, the film we have at our office uh, says that it, it was the entire town was burned down. It was only about a fourth. Um, but anyway, so they go in, and they follow the, the Yankees. Now, at this point, I want to insert that Edmund Kirby Smith, who is the commander of the entire Trans-Mississippi Army, Kirby Smithdom, they call it. Uh, he actually um, takes them, he rides down to Pleasant Hill, and he takes Walker's Texas Division away from Taylor. Now, he had already sent an Arkansas Division under Churchill down as well, and both of those organizations, Kirby Smith says, I need them because there's some some Yankees coming down from from my Little Rock, and they're going to come down and take Shreveport under General Steele. So I need them to go protect up there. So here's Taylor, and he loses half of of his army, and and he was beating them with you know a third of what they had, and now he's lost half of that. But just because you know Kirby Smith wanted to to arrive in time to win the battle for himself, but he didn't. So what happens? Well. Taylor said, well, we're going to keep going and doing this. But he starts writing reports to Kirby Smith and he starts using 
improper language. Uh, I would have to say very graphic improper language. And so Kirby Smith's like, okay, well, look, I know the guy, you know, he has like, he's already sick. He's told me he's sick before the campaign started. He wanted to take off. I'm not going to let him. Let's, you know, I'm just going to overlook this. So Taylor goes and keeps fighting and he goes on down to Yellow Bayou and they have a battle there. And then finally, um, Banks realizes, oh, wait, we, we can't get across the river because we used all our pontoon boats to make the dam up at Alexandria. <laughs> so now how do we get down there, you know, across the river, the Chapalaya River, in case people try to lull you into thinking it's pronounced some other way, it's at Chapalaya. <laughs> so when you get down there at, at the Chapalaya River, there's, they can't cross. They don't have any pontoon boats. How's the army going to get across the river? Joe Bailey steps up again. And he does something pretty amazing. He lines up 22 steamboats side by side in, in the river. And then he has Company A of the 37th Illinois Infantry, which is probably the most well-traveled infantry group I've ever seen in my entire life. They, were every, they just came down to build the plank. They put planks across the front decks of these ships so the whole army can come down. So they were there for that. And then they left to go to New Orleans. I mean, they were, they were just, you know, they, they were a very handy group. And uh, so anyway, they get down all the way and cross the river and they're safe, you know. And, and uh, for a while, it was sort of neat to read. I, I had one letter I found where they jacked the gunboats up because in crossing the top of the dam, it scraped the, the rocks and, and the sandstone deposits in the river. And so they had jacked up the... Can you imagine jacking up a gunboat with, with iron rails on the side? And you jacked it all the way up, and you're under there trying to fix it. I would not be wanting to be the guy underneath the gunboat fixing it. Hey, Captain, I've got it here. I'm putting it up. So anyway, they, uh, they cross the river. Now, Taylor by this time is really livid. You know, now, now, remember, you know, Taylor is Zachary Taylor's son. He has no military experience. Now, he, fathered, he fo followed his father uh, in, in Mexico, but he was sort of a sickly kid. He was 16. He was sort of a sickly kid, and, and uh, he didn't really you know, participate in any action. But he, he read a lot of, a lot of you know, historical uh, books on, on battles and things. So he was, he was pretty savvy about it, but he was an Ivy League guy. But here we go, and, and so he's... he's uh, getting down there, and he realizes, well, geez, I, I almost had them backed up against the, the Chafalaya River before Bailey came and got him out of a bind again. He almost inherited the Navy from, from you know, from the Union by, you know, the, the water being low. There was no possible way they could have burned all of those gunboats and made them unusable. So imagine now, Confederate Navy, gunboats, ironclads, going Taking, see, most of the ironclads got sent up on, on this trip. So now what's protecting New Orleans? You have, say, you know, steamers and, and wooden boats. Not a lot of them. And if you had some, they're maybe they're, they're tin clads or something like that. So they're not very well protected. So again, Taylor was just livid that he was not able to have the troops to take care of business and capture all of Banks' army. So he kept writing and elevating his level of cursing uh, to his commander, Kirby Smith. I mean, I've seen some of the original letters and some of the cursing got through, but the guy that was writing them for him would scratch out like <laughs> stuff like, you know, your mother wears combat boots. Uh, that, that's a really nice one, but you know what I mean? He was really, really bad. And so finally, Kirby Smith said, well, wait, you're, you're, I don't need you anymore. The Yankees have already crossed the river. I'm going to put you under arrest. He put Richard Taylor, the winner of Mansfield and Pleasant Hill and the Red River Campaign, Kirby Smith put him under house arrest in Alexandria. How incredibly stupid was that? <laughs> now, within a month's time from when he was arrested in June of 1864, within a month, he got a letter or dispatch from Richmond, from General Bragg, who was... The Jefferson Davis's chief of staff. He said, Hey, I'm directed to tell you that you've now been appointed to Lieutenant General. 
and thank you for such a great job for doing this. Now, by the way, I want you to take 16,000 troops in the Trans-Mississippi. So that's all the infantry in Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana, and all 90% of the artillery. I want you to take them across the river. And where was he going to go? Does anybody know? He was going to go help some guy in Georgia named General John Bell Hood. He was supposed to report to Hood. So he's liking this idea. Now, people wonder why, you know, what did he get special treatment because he was, you know, uh, Zachary Taylor's son? No, he got special treatment because his former brother in law was a guy, <laughs> Jefferson Davis. Yeah, that guy. And so that was his former brother in law, and they got along famously, which is not something that Davis normally did, is get along with a lot of people, but he got along with Taylor because. He married Taylor's sister. She passed away, but they were still brother-in-laws. So anyway, he uh, he's part of the reason that Taylor gets promoted to lieutenant general. And they're going to transfer him first to to Georgia. And if that works out well, then uh, you know he's going to join Hood. Now, extra 16,000 people and go up to Franklin and Tennessee and do that thing. And so it was a wonderful opportunity for Taylor to do this. So his only problem was, how do I get across the Mississippi River with 16,000 troops? So now the first idea he had was to build a suspension and trestle bridge across the river. Well, wait a second. Didn't the Union take over the river with their gunboats and ironclads? And how's he going to pass? Well, he did this wonderful thing. He said, well, I'm going to get that bridge built across the river. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take torpedoes from Alexandria that I have in storage that were moved down from Shreveport, and I'm going to put them on either side of where they're building the bridge. And then I'm going to get the artillery that I'm taking with me, and I'm going to get them to post right next to the torpedoes so that the gunboats can't get up without sinking. Very wise idea. So he said, well, I'm going to do this. Now, in Alexandria, they had a shortage of canvas. And so what he wanted to make it, well, people didn't know what he was doing. So he said, well, I need to cover up these wagons full of torpedoes because they're sort of obvious, you know, these big pointy things, you know, in the back. So he said, well, what am I going to do? So they said, well, we don't have any canvas, General Taylor. So he said, well, I, how about if we use cow skin? If we just slaughter some cows and take the skin off and put them upside down so that the dry side, not the meat side, but the dry side that they've you know, taken off are facing up. And then they said, well, you know, you might, be, it might cause, you know, something, uh, you know, the, the smell and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to cover it up. It might also be a slightly obvious that you have like meat on the top of your wagon. <laughs> and so he said, well, what am I going to do? So they painted them with tar. So now you have tarred meat <laughs> on the top of your wagon. And of course, nobody's going to be curious when you're going through the back roads to the Natchez area, which is where they were going to build this bridge nobody's going to be you know curious about that there's a couple of you know wagons full of torpedoes with with uh, meat uh, uh on, on the top with with tar on top of that so he he brought them over there and they were they were ready to do it and then now you forget though now here's kirby smith he puts the guy under arrest and in, in just a few weeks time this guy is not only not under arrest but he's been promoted to lieutenant general, which is pretty high rank. And so he says, well, I don't like this. So I'm going to do whatever I can to delay sending him troops. Because if I send him all my troops, I won't have any. And so he did that. He said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to delay sending you troops, uh, you know, to all his people. Let's, let's not send in General Taylor. Like he sent the Crescent Regiment down. And then he said, oh, wait, I need the Crescent Regiment in Shreveport to guard my headquarters for the Trans-Mississippi. So they went back up. And, and then to, to build the forts, they all the Vicksburg troops that had fought at Mansfield and Pleasant Hill underneath the auspice of Louisiana militia, well, they were all finally exchanged in May. And so here's all these troops. They don't have any guns. Uh, let's get them to build some fortifications here to Alexander so we don't have a third Red River campaign. 
And so he did that. Uh, now, how did he get tools for, you know, all these men that, that were under General Thomas, by the way, Richard Taylor's brother-in-law? Um, so how do you get all these, all these uh, troops to, uh, you know, to build this with no tools? Well, he sent a little couple of skiffs down the river to the federal area, and they traded cotton for tools. So that's how they built Fort Randolph and Bulow with those tools that they traded illegally with the Yankees to bring up to Alexandria. So, and again, Taylor's, you know, just picking off Kirby Smith just t tremendously. So Kirby Smith does something extremely dumb. He, there's a, a thing in the, in the Shreveport newspaper that says, hey, let's, you know, maybe mention that, you know, the Confederate Army is going to help General Hood and they're going to cross the river somewhere near Natchez. And it's in the newspaper. Well, who reads, besides Confederates, who reads the Confederate newspapers? Oh, the, the Federals do. And they're like, oh, well, we've got this wonderful ironclad called the Vindicator and we're going to send that up and down the river. So Taylor's like, okay, that idea is shot. So he said, now I'll, I'm going to maybe take those 40 pontoon boats that the, the Bailey left up build the dam with they couldn't cross the Chafalaya with. So I'm going to take those apart and I'm going to take those over and we're going to just cross them over the river at that point. But how are we going to stop ships like the Vindicator? Well, thankfully, uh, he found a uh, guy that was in charge of a naval ship called the Rattler. And he was a federal officer. It was the USS Rattler. Well, this officer wanted to sell this gunboat to Richard Taylor. Richard Taylor approached him and said, hey, can I buy you a gunboat? And the guy said, yeah. <laughs> and so this guy incredulously went back, you know, to a ship. You know, he was the, the lieutenant in charge of the ship. And he said, hey, if I can, you know, like maybe get like the engineer and the pilot and all those guys and get them on my side, we go sell this gunboat to Richard Taylor and we, you know, We'll go down to New Orleans and, you know, say we're captured or something. So, so they did that. Uh, you know, he did that. He went and talked to everybody on the ship, said, hey, I'm going to sell this gunboat to Richard Taylor. Well, some people didn't like that. And so what they did was they said, hey, we're putting you under arrest. <laughs> and so they, they put him in this cabin, and he's, he's able to eventually escape to a porthole. And he swims over. And then he goes up to John Taylor, well, I'm sorry, they can't. and Taylor doesn't want to talk to him because he has no use for him anymore because he doesn't have a gunboat. So what's this guy going to do? Well, uh, a Texan who had, had been wounded over in Virginia and was walking home to Texas, um, he mentioned seeing this guy sitting on, uh, when he's crossing the Mississippi River, this guy was sitting there on the porch uh, with this uh, southern lady right across the river from where he was crossing. And he goes over there and asks him, and then the guy tells him the story about, well, I can't go back to my ship because I tried to sell it. I can't go to Taylor because he didn't want to see me. So I'm just, I'm just going to stay right here. And so, so he did. But anyway, so Taylor is stymied every time that he tries to come up with a way to take those 16,000 troops across the river. So finally, he realizes, I just can't do it. And so Bragg at that point said, Okay, well, look, we're going to send you over and you're going to take command of the Department of Alabama, Mississippi, and East Louisiana. And you can be the commander of that. And your main protection is to take care of Mobile. So that's what happened. So Richard Taylor on a skiff had a, had a black slave with him. They crossed on the Mississippi River on a skiff in the middle of the night. They were dragging a horse with them. They were swimming right next to the skiff. They get over there. So here's Richard Taylor, who is supposed to have 16,000 troops when he crosses the thing and and 15,998 of them didn't show up, you know, because he couldn't find a way to get them across. Now, there was another reason why the troops were not enthusiastic about crossing. It was the Texans. They were bad enough to have to come to Louisiana to protect their homes in Texas so their battlefields were not in Texas. So they certainly did not want to cross the river and want to try to go over there and help anybody east of the Mississippi River. So they, a lot of them refused. And so what did Richard Taylor do? 
that to the guys uh, like captain level and stuff trying to get their whole companies to go home to Texas and everything? Or he just had the guys executed. Because he, you know, he's like, hey, you don't want to stay in my army? You don't want to do discipline? You signed up for the war? We're just going to, you know, shoot you. And so, so he shot a bunch of Texas captains and, and officers that wanted their men to go home. And so he gets over there and he ends up doing pretty good. Um, while, while he was there and, and just arrived in, the, in this new department, he kept getting these uh, telegrams uh, from a guy named John Bell Hood. Hey, when are you coming? You coming? You coming? Where are you coming? Are you going to come soon? I mean, we'd love to see you. you know, where are you coming? And, uh, and uh, Taylor said, I won't be coming. That's all he replied. And so Hood, we know what happened to him. And Taylor, though, managed to hold out and keep Mobile until April 9th, 1865, uh, when the two forts, uh, Spanish Fort uh, and Fort Morgan, were, were taken, and uh, he couldn't do anything else. So he did surrender. Uh, and Taylor's just such an interesting fellow. I, I would... I would suggest that you, uh, not only as the story of my book, uh, but just just in general, um, you know, any story you will see, it was so amazing. No, after the war, no Confederate officer was allowed to come into Washington, D.C. because Lincoln had been killed and they were worried about that. Well, who went to Washington, D.C.? Richard Taylor. Well, wait. They banned all the Confederate officers from going there because they didn't want to start anything, but they let Richard Taylor in. And they let nobody. They didn't let Winnie Davis. They didn't let Verena Davis. They didn't let anybody see Davis while he was in prison there at Fort, Fortress Monroe, except for Richard Taylor. They let him in. He went to talk to the president. He talked to members of Congress. He got in because he knows his dad was president. He knows how to talk to people. And he knows how to use power. And he spent a lot of time in Louisiana. So he knows how to work, you know, politicians really well. So he got in to see Davis. And Davis, probably for about three minutes, didn't say anything. And finally, he stood up out of his prison bed. And he looked over at Taylor and he said, I knew he would come. And so that's how Taylor ended the end of the war. Um, it was a wonderful uh, ride, um, and, but it sort of ended ingloriously because of uh, uh, Kirby Smith and the, the lack of crossing the troops. Because imagine, as you well know, Longstreet goes over to Chickamauga, and that makes a big difference there. That wins the, the battle for the Confederacy. So if Taylor would have got over to Atlanta, oh, that would have been a little shot in the arm. And then coming from behind, that was sort of like what Joe Johnson almost did to try to relieve Vicksburg, but he didn't didn't pull it off. He didn't do it. Yeah, didn't do it as well. But anyway, I want to thank y'all for uh, for inviting me to speak. And, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Yes, ma'am. The whole purpose of the Red River campaign. Cotton. Cotton. Yeah, there's actually a great book uh, by Ludwell Johnson. It is the original book written on the Red River Campaign. And the name of the, it says the Red River Campaign, and the subtitle is Politics in Cotton. And of course, you know, he wanted to be the mayor too. Yes, ma'am. Uh, president. Achafalaya. A T C H A F A L A Y A. Well, we're going to have to remember that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, believe me, you don't want to mispronounce anything like right on the, when you go up uh, towards Mansfield and Pleasant Hill up the interstate or whatever, there's a little, there's a little exit called um, uh, where Monoise Ferry is and it's called uh, Cloutierville, but it's spelled C L O U T I E R Ville, Cloutierville, but it's pronounced Cloutierville. And if you mispronounce it, they might they might want to offer you some pie. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. Thank you.